Hey everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Atlas. I am super pumped to be talking about all things science fiction. We have Robert J. Sawyer joining us on the show. Hi, Rob. How are you doing, Atlas? Thanks so much for coming on the program. An absolute pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. I'm so excited. Rob's background is so epic. He's a 24-time sci-fi author translated across over 20 languages, winning myriad awards, including Hugo and Nebula, with a deep focus on the nature of reality, consciousness, and the future of humanity. You can find his links in the bio below to all of his books at sfwriter.com, also his Twitter profile. This is going to be epic. Let's start things off with this biggest question what is the nature of reality and consciousness? Well, they're obviously intertwined. I think if there was a lesson of quantum physics, it is that there is no reality, no one single concrete reality until a conscious observer comes along. And this is so t counterintuitive to everything that humanity believes since the dawn of time. We talk as, uh, you know, a child is growing up, a child gains uh, a notion of object permanence at some point, that just because they don't see the object, it's been put away in a chest of drawers, the object is still there. It has material reality. Its existence is independent of the child. Well, we consider that the normal evolution of our, of our intellectual abilities as we age in our lifespan, but it turns out that that is a crock. In fact, the object has no permanence. It is not there until it is being observed. And so the two are so intertwined, reality and consciousness, that you really can't ask what one is without answering it's the other one. The consciousness, the awareness, the observer, the witness is in many ways the nature of reality. And that the world of form or physicalism that this is appears as that and that this may even be only one of so many possible creation designs and that how do you take that perspective in while you do your sci-fi authoring Right. You know, the fundamental question about writing science fiction is, are you writing the future or are you writing a future? We take as a given that starting at this juncture, whatever moment in time it is right now, that there's a panoply of possibilities in front of us, any number of possible futures. And yet we have sort of hard coded into the way we think about things that the present is the one and only present, and the past is the immutable one and only past. Well, again, this last century of physics has blown that out of the water. There are endless, almost certainly, I mean, we don't know 100% for sure, but everything that we find in terms of modern physics seems to indicate that there are as many nows as, as, as you could arbitrarily want, up to an infinite number of nows, of parallel realities, of versions of reality where Donald Trump didn't become president, where instead it was Hillary Clinton. Versions of reality going back where Al Gore became president instead of uh, George W. Bush. Versions of reality going back where the French uh, controlled North America instead of the English. All of those have equal validity to the particular idiosyncratic random draw from the hat that we happen to think of as the one we exist in. I also frequently do the, the creation design and simulation game where I go and I, I visualize what the North American continent would look like if the if we didn't come over here. <laughs> right, exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I live in Canada, right? And, you know, the American Manifest Destiny, American, the, the slogan was, I don't know if they still teach this in American schools, but we Canadians are vividly conscious of the American Manifest Destiny slogan, which is 54, 40 or bust, which is the 54th parallel in 40 minutes of latitude. 
up north. I live down at 44 degrees latitude, right? I live below the 49th parallel because Toronto and Southern Ontario sticks down along the contours of the Great Lakes. If America had succeeded in its manifest destiny, Canada would essentially not exist. We would just be a frozen tundra north. Uh, if, of course, uh, the Europeans hadn't come over just half a millennium ago, almost no time at all in terms of human history. If the Europeans hadn't come over, we would have a rich and vigorous array of Aboriginal and Indigenous cultures still alive in North America. A very, very different and very worthwhile and very uh, wonderful uh, North America, very different than the one you and I happen to acknowledge as our consensus reality at the moment. And like you describe, any of the, poss the possibility space, in many ways, it's like a, a Bayesian cloud of probabilities. It's kind of like the, quote, electron cloud in the quantum mechanical understanding. And that there are these denser areas where there's a higher likelihood for civilization to evolve towards. That's it, right. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if you ask, based on American history, what's the likelihood that the current president of the United States would be a lawyer? It's extremely high. Most presidents have been lawyers. That's a Bayesian likelihood. That's the principle of mediocrity. What's the likelihood that it would be a reality show host? <laughs> well, given, given that until 25 years ago, there was no such thing as a reality show host, you would have to say, we live in an extraordinarily unlikely universe in which a newly created job, reality show host, gives rise to the most powerful, or becomes the most powerful person in the world. We are bucking the Bayesian trend enormously in that particular, and in many others, and in many others, you know, where uh, there are those who would say, we were way overdue for a pandemic, right? Way over a century given the density of our populations and the interconnectivity of our international travel, why didn't we get hit by something, you know, really bad in the 1960s? Who knows? We buck the Bayesian trends all along, all the time, which is one of the good arguments that somebody is tweaking our reality, that the parameters we're seeing are not the ones that would be drawn at random, from the likely Bayesian space of probabilities, but some of them are such complete outliers that you got to say, who the heck is, is loading our dice when we throw in and make this reality? Yeah, seeing things like the big decision tree and the big cloud of possibilities, and then also having a, a, a level of awareness around the eradication of suffering and the maximization of well-being and prosperity and abundance is, is critical. I'm curious, I want to I wanna play with you on this. Do we all come from the same source? So that's a really interesting question because quantum mechanics can be very solipsistic, which says, of course you, we do because you're a figment of my imagination. I am the only source. I am the only observer in this universe and everything that, you know, you are either a, an aspect of me or a non-player character. You're a philosopher zombie. I have consciousness. You do not. You just pretend or you look like. You act like you have consciousness, but don't really. So from that point of view, one can argue, you know, very solipsistically, of course, everything comes from that single source. Um, if you take, though, that there are, in fact, almost 8 billion distinct, separate individuals, it does get kind of interesting that we have any sort of consensus reality. You know, William Gibson, my fellow Canadian science fiction writer, uh, talks about what, you know, he called cyberspace being a consensual illusion. Consensual meaning that you and I and everybody else had agreed to visualize cyberspace the way that he described it. It has nothing at all to do with, in fact, the photons or the electrons moving in the fiber optics or the, or the, uh, we know, wire cables that actually make up the internet, but we visualize it and we agree on that. So do we all come from the same source? There are either 8 billion different sources of reality and it's astonishing that there's any continuity 
of moment to moment, or there's only one source of reality, which is either I'm a figment of your imagination or you're a figment of mine. I don't know which is more correct, except as Mr. Spock once famously said, you know, I am convinced that I exist. You know, the cogito ergo sum in Vulcan is, I know I'm here, I'm here. So if one of us is not really the source, it's got to be you, because I know it ain't me. I'm curious how this resonates with you, the idea of coming from the same source, meaning that the observer is shared across all of us. Yeah, I think there's a lot of sense that that has to be true. We seem to have, you know, we argued, you and I just a few minutes ago about or discussed object permanence, but we do seem to, you know, I can remember, I, I'm 60 years old, six zero. I can't remember back 60 years, but I can remember back 55 years and to a few things. And I can remember back 40 years in an enormous amount of detail. And if you, let's go back 20 years at, at age that you'll remember. If we go back 20 years, you and I will compare notes and we may or may, you know, as memory is famously fallible, disagree about some details, but then we would go and both look at Wikipedia and find out, oh yeah, you were right or I was right, you know, it really did go down this way. Oh yeah, that's the way it was. So there's definitely a consensus, a, 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 even if you're collapsing the wavefront separately from me collapsing the wavefront, somehow there's a, a holographic uh, reality building up where you're collapsing wave fronts and mine coincide to make a reality that you and I can have a conversation about. And I think that's extremely profound. And at the level of discussing the observer phenomenon in quantum physics, there's not a lot of discussion of, yeah, but how come two people, you know, theoretically two people could simultaneously each be, you know, one light second away from Schrodinger's cat box. One, to the, one second to the left and one light second to the right. So they both look simultaneously. One second later, is the cat dead or alive? Why is there a consensus? Why do two observers ultimately share uh, a version of reality so that they can interact, so that they can have a conversation, so that they can actually say, okay, I'm going to mail you something and you're going to get it in the mail. We've only really just begun to deal with the fact that the observer effect has to be spread across. The current 8 billion people who exist now are the 100 billion homo sapiens who've existed since the dawn of time. And usually what is meant by love is awareness that we share that witness. We share- Yeah, I think, that, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it fascinates me. Empathy fascinates me. Love fascinates me because there's always this reductionist tendency in evolutionary thinking to reduce, well, you know, of course there's attachment to your children because that is your selfish genes making sure that your children live long enough to have children. But it, you know, I, and a lot of my friends, I have to say, it's a very, almost pandemic among science fiction writers. There are an awful lot of us who don't have any children by choice. You know, I, 20 years ago, voluntarily chose to get sterilized. I got a vasectomy. Now, what the hell is up with that? What possible evolutionary forces resulted in a sane, intelligent human being choosing to absent himself, herself, themselves from the reproductive rat race. Clearly, there is, and yet I love my nieces. I love my, none of whom are biologically related to me, but I love them. I love a lot of my fellow men and women. I love the human race. I feel great empathy. And yet this reductionism that says it's all about reproduction, it's clearly not true. There clearly is such a thing as empathy and even love beyond this desire to reduce it to just a Richard Dawkins-esque selfish genes uh, scenario. And I would also be curious how you feel about things like this, which is the 
sort of one of the interpretations of the way that consciousness is, is that consciousness is across you and I is both this blank, pure, bare, empty consciousness. And then on the, on the Rob Sawyer side, it's then colored with your name, the identity, you get a little sun. And on mine, mine's colored with Atlas and it's colored with a tree. And so the idea is that this pure consciousness is shared and then it gets colored by the different experiences. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, it's interesting you said the word color because uh, I have uh, three male cousins all of whom are colorblind, right? So they literally see the universe. Even if we agree on, you know, the physical objects that are around us, here's a microphone, here's an easy chair, there's a book, there's a filing cabinet, I got them backwards or a bookcase behind me. Even if we agree, we still don't see them the same way. Now you and I presume, and it's one of those classic conundra in uh, theory of consciousness. To me, when you held those up, those looked like orange post-it notes. Um, but my perception of orange or yellow and your perception of orange and yellow, we just have to agree as a, because there's no point in disagreeing that they're the same when in fact your orange might look like my green and vice versa. And we simply have no way of knowing. We have to sort of take as a given that some aspects of what we perceive communally are identical, observer independent, and some aspects very much depend on the fact that, well, for one thing, you know, without my glasses, I couldn't have made out the little detail of the sun or the tree, right? The sun and the tree are still there, apparently, on your post-its, but I lack the physiological wherewithal to perceive, wherewithal to perceive them until I add a prosthetic to the case. You, unless you're wearing uh, contact lenses, you have better vision than I and have a different, even a higher level physical perception of reality than I at my advanced age am capable of anymore. And yet we assume that the details that there's just uh, what you're seeing and what I see essentially coincide regardless of our physical abilities to resolve what we're seeing. Yeah, exactly. It's fascinating. And this would be that shared observer if we come from the same source and we share the observer that is then being colored all of these different ways it's having the different experiences from our unique perspectives and that i have this tree be, I'm being colored by this tree right now. You're being colored by the sun. You're colored as a science fiction author. I'm colored as an interviewer, right? There's seeing it from this perspective where we share this pure consciousness that is actually, if we had 8 billion of these, that that field of consciousness would be that sameness but then the different coloration and then those eight billion would be one mm -hmm. one yeah but it would be a much bigger square right one of the fascinating things about the wisdom of crowds is if you ask people individually how many jelly beans are in the jar for instance right and you ask a hundred people you can get numbers all over the place and nobody is good at guessing the number in the jar. But if you ask a thousand people and aggregate their answers, you get an extremely precise answer, very, very close, if not bang on, to the number of jelly beans actually in the jar. And we talk about how interconnectivity through the internet brings human minds together in a way that's kind of a super consciousness but we very rarely ever talk about it outside of the computing metaphor that there in fact are 8 billion human beings who aggregate to a you know an almost a tr uh, you know uh, Arden, yeah yeah tr de Chardin, um a noosphere that yeah. we are this 
elaborate thing that, you know, there's, okay, the average IQ is 100 by definition, but there are 8 billion times 100 IQ points out there, which is 800 billion. <laughs> it took every one of my IQ points to do that math. Eight, and I, a, a global IQ of 800 billion, right? Which is an incredible uh, entity to be grappling with. Yeah, yeah. Another question would be that, is this reality created by that source as a creative exploration? So that's an interesting question. If there's a source to reality or a source to our consciousness, does the source itself have consciousness, self-awareness, volition, needs and wants? Or is it like asking, you know, the source of the Nile ultimately is where the Nile River flows from, and it's part of the hydrological cycle and so forth. Do raindrops, you know, which give rise to rivers, lakes, and oceans, uh, do raindrops actually have all of the same qualia, all of the same characteristics that an ocean has an aggregate? And the answer is clearly not. Raindrops don't have tides. Raindrops don't have, you know, convection zones within them, and oceans do. So we don't know the answer to your question. It's conceivable. And of course, the religious perspective is, well, of course, we're all atoms of God. We've all come as little uh, uh, fragments, and that God is fractal in the sense, or we're fractals of God, that you zoom in on us, and you find consciousness, you pull back, and you find consciousness. Now, is consciousness on a universal scale fractal that no matter whatever level you zoom in on it there's self-awareness or is it hierarchical so that only at certain levels of instantiation roughly two meters tall let's say that you actually have consciousness and that our subatomic particles don't so panpsychism is out if you say that and the whole larger being may lack consciousness as well one of the things that's required for instance for our kind of consciousness, and it may be a biological remnant of our evolution, is a perspective, a point of view. I'm looking at this. I'm concentrating on you right now. I'm not blissfully unaware, except in this odd circumstance that I've actually can see that there's, you know, pine wood paneling on the uh, cabinetry behind me. But if I wasn't looking at myself in a monitor, I'm blissfully unaware of more than 180 degrees of reality behind me, visually at least. What is the reality of the super consciousness or the source? It's eminently debatable at this point, And I think all positions are defensible because we don't have enough information yet. And it deeply relates to that earlier part of our conversation where the entire possibility space of these creation designs is being explored. All of the different decision trees, even of our one design of a reality are all unfolding. And that style of uh, imagination, which is extremely required for science fiction yeah. and, and even for children, children are that imagination when they are, when that is being fostered in them from early childhood. And then in a sense, if we're not vigilant, what happens is sometimes the economic machinery can come and just, just completely just squelch, just destroy that imaginative capacity. And that imagination is really what is needed to tackle many of the biggest challenges on, on the plan to think way outside of the, of right. the box. Yeah. And to think of things that have not yet come to pass. Yeah. Um, you know, we know that dogs, for instance, dream. You can do experiments. You know, one of the things that happens when you sleep is you have sleep paralysis, which means you don't act out what it is you're doing in your dream, right? It's the difference between walking and dreaming of walking. In dreaming of walking, you don't walk. And we consider it uh, a pathology if you are in fact sleepwalking, if you don't have dream paralysis, right? That's wrong. But we can do the opposite. We can take a dog and we can do the neurological chemical stuff to 
put an end to its sleep paralysis so that you can see what the dog is dreaming about. And what is the dog dreaming about? The dog is dreaming about chasing prey. The dog is dreaming about digging in the dirt. The dog never dreams about flying. The dog never shows any indication of envisioning something that isn't just reliving a pleasant memory or in a bad dream, reliving an unpleasant memory, but nothing, nothing imaginative, nothing of saying, this has never happened before, but maybe could. And obviously, dogs are not nearly as intellectually sophisticated as we are, but Homo neanderthalensis, our closest cousin, there's a lot of good evidence that Neanderthals had very limited, if any, ability to think imaginatively, to think of things that they hadn't already experienced. So that, for instance, we have a continuous gradation in the uh, paleoarchaeological record of tool uh, refinement. You'll see we keep making different and different and different tools generation by generation. Neanderthals had an essentially static industry. They made tools the way beavers made dams, right? One beaver doesn't say, oh, you know, time to innovate. Time to come up with the, the you know, the Frank Lloyd Wright of uh, dams. Uh, I'm just going to make a dam just like my great, 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 great grandfather made a dam. That's the only thing I know how to do. That's all Neanderthals knew how to do. But we had the ability to look at a flint nodule and see something in it. It's like as Michelangelo would say, you know, how do you make David, the sculpture David? Well, you look at the rock and you take away everything that isn't David, right? That's an enormous uh-huh. intellectual capacity that no, as far as we can tell, no other life form, including even our closest now extinct relatives the Neanderthals had that capability to look and envision something that they hadn't already seen as empirical reality. Would you say that <clears throat> Similarly to how we at night we dream a a four dimensional so three space one time and we immerse ourselves in it in a first person perspective. Would you say that? that could be what this is? Well, it's interesting because a lot of dreaming, you're right, is first person, but there's also a lot of third person perspective dreaming. You see yourself in a dream, which is an astonishing intellectual leap, right? You don't think of a a dog or a parrot or a chimpanzee visualizing itself from a distance, right? It's all that point of view perspective, that very tunneled vision perspective. So that reality, the fact that we can be a participant in a dream while seeing ourselves at a distance is what evolutionary advantage there was to that, I don't know. The other aspect of dreams, what we call dream logic, things that don't make sense in a Newtonian world of physics, we accept and go with within a dream. And we just go, yeah, and it doesn't cause a discontinuity. You don't wake, wait a minute, what's going on here? That can't possibly happen. Nobody ever wakes up from a dream by their brain sort of crashing and saying, wait, I just envisioned something that defies the laws of physics, like me flying or whatever, right? You just go with it. So there's some very nimble quality to human consciousness that's able to do, and I don't want to, you know, give any credence necessarily to mystical thing uh, of out-of-body experiences, but it's a reality that we can visualize ourselves in an out-of-body perspective. And it's a reality that despite all of the training that starts even pre-utero in, you know, uh, pre-birth uh, uh, in the uterus, that starts with learning about physics and, you know, hearing noises, hearing your mother's pulse and feeling the world shake as your mother walks around and so forth. All of that training, Newtonian physics that you get from way before you're born till the day you die can go right out the window and your brain still goes along with it in dream state. 
is extraordinary. I don't know what the ramifications are or why our brains evolved to be able to do that. But the fact that the brain can function with a version of reality that's at odds with every waking moment of reality it's ever experienced is really quite mind blowing. One of the hypotheses is the model based reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo tree search so that we're constantly doing these simulations in our minds about what the most optimal path forward is for maximizing our future outcomes. And it'd be interesting to hear your perspective about the as above, so below aphorism that the same way that we dream for a third of our lives, we sleep for a third of our lives and we dream for that period of time, that as we were discussing the idea of that observer being shared, right, the blank side of it, that this in itself coming from the same source, the perennial wisdom across the planet's traditions say that this is what God is, that God is the blank, pure consciousness that is then eternally being colored by these right. different, yeah. So how does, right. that, how does that resonate with you? So it's a very interesting question because if God is such a loaded word, right? You know, um, is God uh, the the far future descendant of us high school student who's doing his project or her project, making a simulation in the laboratory? And if so, you know, are we only kind of like a C plus, right? We're not like the one that's going to go on to the science fair. We're the student who's just getting by and made this universe with all of its its myriad obvious uh, structural flaws. Um, or is God this incredibly beyond uh, our comprehension, uh, super intellect? You know, I talked uh, a few minutes ago about an IQ, uh, additive IQ of the planet of 800 billion uh, IQ points. You know, God would be infinitely beyond that. Um, it really comes down to a matter of personal choice of whether you want to think we're living in a really cleverly designed reality or a really shoddily designed reality. And you can argue it kind of either way, but my argument would be my own personal perspective is if there's any design in this reality, it certainly isn't omnipotent design. It is fairly contingent, rough and ready, uh, quick and dirty solutions to complex problems design, which is very much what our evolutionary history shows, you know? I mean, uh, obviously, I actually, my hand hurts today. I don't know why. I did something to this, right, right, thumb here. Well, you know, 250 million years ago, or 400 million years ago, this was one of the uh, supporting rods in the pectoral fin of a fish, right? It was never intended to be used to hit the space bar, on a keyboard, right? Mm -hmm. Half a billion years later. And yet that's what I use it for. Now, ow, it hurts. So this is a rough and ready solution to uh, the contingent problem of you know, how do I communicate without words, you know, with a keyboard, blah, blah, blah. Um, it seems that an awful lot of our reality is similar to that. The repurposing, the reusing uh, of something rather than coming up with an optimal um, bespoke solution to the actual problem that's at hand. The perennial wisdom across the planetary spiritual traditions is so deeply pragmatically beneficial as well for maximizing well-being because typically what happens is like when we recognize ourselves as this one source that is this pure consciousness that is then being colored. There goes half our consciousness. You dropped it. Half <laughs> the, yeah. Oops. I bring you these 15, <laughs> these 10 commandments. <laughs> 
So it's having all these different experiences, right? We just had the experience of humor, right? Yes, that's right. And, you know, you just had the experience of uh, one of the soft drinks and I just had an experience of some tea and we're having the experience of interview right now. And uh, later we may have the experience of some food and these types of things. And so the sort of way of understanding it also uh, as an analogy is this sort of ocean. We use these analogies a lot, the ocean of the pure consciousness that is undergoing these different waves of experience, the Rob Sawyer wave, this Atlas wave, and then the, the soft drink, the humor, the tea, all these different waves of experience. And so one of the things that comes from that process is this sort of, the sort of recognition that in a sense, there's like a relaxing that happens, like the, the egoic sort of contracted uh, separate entity it dissolves and the into sort of what the the blank side is it dissolves more and more into the blank side and that doesn't mean that it's not going to continue getting really great colorations of experience it's just that it becomes more and more aware of what its true nature is and that then that true nature is argued in many ways to be a peace Mm -hmm. and a happiness yeah Right. So I happen to be in a closed room right now. There's oxygen molecules about, you know, whatever it is, 20% of them dispersed around mostly nitrogen, a little bit of carbon dioxide, a few other things in here. Statistically, there's oxygen all over the room and I'm breathing just fine here, right? But there's a chance that it could all end up in that corner and I would suffocate. We live in a world of probabilities. The probability of that is such an outlier that in all of my life, I've never known anybody who actually suffocated because all the oxygen molecules in whatever room they were in happened to all go to one corner. They could. There's a statistical possibility. We look at, you know, an electron, and we know an electron is a cloud. It's a probability. Highly likely it's here, a little less likely it's here, very unlikely that it's over here, but it could be. That actually resonates with the utilitarian notion of good, the greatest good for the greatest number, which is not an egoist notion. It's not the greatest good for me. And if it works out well for you, okay, so much the better. I'm happy to share, but it's got to be better for me than, than anybody else or I'm not interested. No, no, no. Our morality is very much a statistical morality, or at least utilitarianism is very much a statistical morality, just as our physical reality is a statistical reality. By and large, more than likely, the best outcome for me physically is that the oxygen molecules are distributed evenly throughout this room. And ethically, that throughout the 8 billion of us on the planet, most of us are doing better off than those of us who don't happen to be doing better off at that you know particular juncture. So it really resonates for me that at both of my parents, I'll tell you this, it resonates for me because it's how I was brought up. Both my parents were professional statisticians. They both taught at the University of Toronto. And uh, it very much resonates for me that the central concept of physics that emerged during their lifetime, they were born in the 1920s, during their lifetime, the central concept that we live in is statistically determined as opposed to a concretely determined uh, universe. And that morality is based, that what we seem to come around to, again, to invoke Mr. Spock, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, that our morality is also a statistical morality. Uh, You could say, well, it's just coincidence one and the other, that they both happen to be, you know, games of probabilities. But it also may just be a fundamental reflection of the universe that we live in on an ethical and a physical basis are both games of probability. Does it, does it resonate to call the sort of wisdom from those perennial traditions of this being the source or the God or the, 
eternity or the infinity that is constantly expressing itself in all of these different creative ways. And that similarly to how we as above, so below, we go into this dream environment at night that we as that source or that God create this dream environment where we take on these different perspectives of the dream environment and immerse ourselves into it as a creative exploration. How does that resonate? Yeah, it's very interesting because you use the word God, you use the word source. You know, in science or in the law, for instance, another interesting case, very precise language has to be used. And you and I have to agree. We have to have, a, as they say in the law, a meeting of minds. If we don't agree on what one pound of rice the grain rice. If we don't agree on one pound of rice, what those terms mean, we can't make a contract that I'm going to buy and you're going to sell me a pound of rice. If to me, rice is, you know, white rice and to you it's brown rice and we haven't agreed and we we don't have a meeting of minds. We don't use that term rice to mean the same thing. Uh, And in science, of course, it's all about when I say, you know, the universe and mm-hmm. you say the universe, you know, we talk about island, you know, Hubble gave us the notion of the island universe, which we now have another word for it, the galaxy, which wasn't, you know, a concept separately, right? Uh, that galaxies are sort of little island universes, but when we say the universe, we mean the sum total of what well, Carl Sagan called the cosmos, right? When we are imprecise with our language, in some ways, that's a very positive thing because it allows everybody to be right and feel good. But in other ways, it keeps us from actually having a meeting of minds on what we're discussing. So, you know, uh, everybody defines God or the absence of God to his or her or their own satisfaction. And it's one of those very, very slippery terms, whereas everybody, we have a general agreement, you know, um, uh, about, say, what the United States is in terms of geography. Would you, Hawaii, would you say that it would be possible to use the word God as the, as the observer? Uh, sure, I think so. I think so, absolutely. Uh, as long as, you know, and you have communication, as long as any two people agree about it. I mean, um, you know, Einstein famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Well, he was wrong. Uh, Stephen Hawking, the last paragraph of, um, of uh, A Brief History of Time, says if we were to do this, we would know the mind of God. Both of them were using the word God, Einstein and, and Hawking, I think in a way that uh, a Judeo-Christian um, preacher, theologian, rabbi, would not recognize as being the same concept. So God is a, is a very tricky term to invoke because it's used by even atheists to refer to the sum total of, uh, of the physical parameters that define reality. Uh, I don't know if we ever will come up with a consensus term that everybody agrees with for what the source, the source is as good a term as any. Although up here in Canada, I don't know if it's the same in the States, Radio Shack went out of business up here in Canada and the company that now sells all that junk consumer electronics is called The Source. I'd like to think that whatever The Source really is, it's something better than selling me overpriced flashlights and LED clocks, you know. <laughs> uh, that's usually what the perennial spiritual wisdoms point to which is they just take their different like flavors of ice cream right but it's all ice cream and it's all ice cream that's right that's and, right and uh, similarly they're different faces different paths yeah. to the one end well you know and it, i mean in a very specific spiritual sense christianity is fascinating because it has the triune god you know oppenheimer named the Trinity test site after Trinity, right? That is an incredible concept when you think about it, that we live in a a reality where one thing can also be three things. This is a Christian, very direct Christian dogma, that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit 
are three different manifestations or ways of perceiving one specific thing. The divinity of Christ in Christianity is based on the assertion not that God, that Jesus is somehow something that God made the way in Christianity God made Adam, but that Jesus is God, that they are, that there's a, they have communion, that when you take communion, that you are taking into you actual material of God. These are from a physics standpoint, from a theoretical physics standpoint, or quantum physics standpoint, enormously sophisticated concepts that something can manifest itself in three very different ways. It's a, it's a um, God, uh, not duality, but whatever the triple version of that is, triality, right? Uh, you know, wave particle duality we accept as physical, and in that particular religious tradition, there's, a, there's an analog, only it's a three-part analog, that God, depending on how you're looking for God, you will find, depending on what kind of experiment you conduct, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, or the Holy Spirit. And yet nobody would say, no, no Christian theologian would say, that they're anything other than the same thing. Just as no modern physicist would say that the electron Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a totally different thing when it's a wave than when it's a particle. No, it's the same thing. It's just being perceived in a different way. And that, given that Christianity came to it uh, almost not quite 2,000 years, but, but, but many centuries before physics came to it, the notion that how you look for something shapes what your experiment will, will uh, demonstrate to you is really quite a fascinating parallel. Yes. In the Abrahamic tradition, what is referred to as God is similar as the Tao or as Brahman or as we like to say with entheogens, that we unleash God within. And that's why St. Francis of Assisi said that what you are looking for, seeking externally, is actually what is itself looking so we are looking for what is looking. And that's why we see the, the pursuit of the exogenous happiness, the exterior happiness. But really, that well of honey of peace and happiness is internal. It's just covered under this rock of the contracted, egoic, separate entity. And... That's been one of the perennial wisdoms as much as I, I actually agree with what you said there a lot, which is that we undergo this process of both the perennialism, which is really important, but also the importance of the particularity at the same time is really crucial. I think a good place to take this now would be the conversation about the synthesis of science and spirituality into one. And this is becoming more and more critical and important because they are ultimately one, but they got in, a, in a, an apparent last 500 years split into two in a way where that the post-enlightenment has said that, oh, well, science is its own style of scientific method and following a specific protocol about the investigation of the of the of matter and of materialism whereas the spiritual investigation is typically the investigation inward the investigation into consciousness and the investigation into maximizing one's own uh, peace and and happiness so how do you feel i know you've written a lot about the relationship between the spirituality and science. So how do you feel about where it's at and also where we're heading on a synthesis? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. You know, uh, as a, an evolutionist, obviously I have to admire Stephen Jay Gould, but as a theologian, he was an idiot. He wrote, uh, you know, uh, about science and religion being non-overlapping magisteria, being two realms of uh, intellectual inquiry that, could not ever find a common ground. And I think that was idiotic. I think that was um, yeah. uh, the kind of view of religion that many an atheist comes to 
without ever having actually read much theology or engaged with many people of faith. Uh, they say, oh, you know, we're based on logic. We're based on evidence. We're based on um, empirical uh, proof. Well, you know, Doubting Thomas wanted some empirical proof, too. He wanted to put his hand into Christ's wound to see whether or not what Christ was, was saying was true. Uh, there are an awful, you know, it's not a question of one is just blindly accepting and the other is this kind of very uh, cynical demand for proof. Um, I think that the questions are so complex. Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What does the future hold? Is there a purpose to it all that bringing all the tools to bear is a much more sensible way than saying that this narrow uh, selection of tools is the only way. Uh, that said, when they contradict each other, which they sometimes do, uh, my money is on a replicable reality. But even that is an act of faith. You know, We take as a given that two experimenters conducting the same experiment at different locales at different times will get the same result, that the universe functions with immutable physical laws from moment to moment and pretty much from place to place. That's, a, that's a, an assumption that we, you know, in the even centuries that we've been doing experiments is such a tiny fraction of the 13.77, the new current figure as of this week of how old the universe is, 13.77 billion years, a tiny fraction to say, oh yeah, we understand that the laws of physics have been always the same, the same place at the same time. I think that anybody who is grappling with the questions should be applauded. And the only people who I have no patience for are the ones who don't think that the questions are worth even asking. Yeah. Um, the, you know, it's a really good question. Why are we here? Uh, it may be that we're not here for any reason at all, that everything was a random fluctuation in a vacuum. That may even turn out to be true, but we don't know that it's true. And to be close to the possibility that there's a purpose to it all seems as much a faith-based position. I take this as a given, that there's no reason to it all as uh, any dogmatic religious position might be. And e both of them should be rejected. Dogma should always be rejected in favor of uh, a questing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. The word exploration is the one that really comes as something that is all encompassing in a many ways and even play. Play is another one. To explore and to play is a good, all-encompassing reason for what this is. And what the word eternity and infinity are is that this, these types of play and exploring have always been happening and that this is what that is and that that's style of a, as you were discussing earlier, pre-object permanence, there is a style of infinity and eternity and peace and playful radiance from these toddlers that is just radiating and it's just so beautiful. And then somehow there's a style of uh, an egoic contraction that occurs, especially with the, um, the sort of economic machinery that is uh, in a sense, very indoctrinating um, people into said 40 hour a weeks, just to be able to have the financing to pay for the roof over their head and whatnot. So there's a whole boatload of changes that are being architected in order to be able to maximize the exploration and the play component of it. And another important topic for us to talk about is on the future of humanity side of things, something that you and I are both 
really passionate about figuring out is sort of what is this well, you, we can use this term metaverse. It's been sort of in, helpful for, for for me. And in, by definition, for from what I understand, it's something along the lines of the synthesis of things like artificial general intelligence, the indistinguishable virtual realities, the biotech and neurotech, like the Neuralinks and whatnot. And so is where we are going a style of metaverse and are we going to continue doing things like exploring and playing in these new indistinguishable virtual realities that we immerse ourselves into that will have so many cool new designers and new ways to play and immerse ourselves into? And is this also potentially what that already is? Are we already doing that? You know, as we... Um a talk it's just a few days since there was the storming of the u.s capitol building um by a mob and when you look at the news coverage of that it's nowhere near as exciting as avengers endgame it's nowhere near as exciting as the latest mission impossible film uh, or the climactic battle of star wars and yet it's infinitely more gripping because we understand that it's real as opposed to fake. Just a few guys clambering up, you know, the, the walls of the building. That, that's not super exciting in and of itself, but the consequences, the gravitas of the fact that it really was happening and happening at the people's house in the, uh, you know, the capital of the most powerful nation on earth made, for many of us, made it incredibly riveting viewing um and we will if we aren't already at the stage we soon will be at the stage where we'll be able to create simulations and virtual realities immersive experiences that are indistinguishable from reality but still i think that there is going to be a fundamental part back here in the amygdala or somewhere in the middle of the brain there asking that really important question is this real or is this fake is it live or is it memorex and the fact that if it ain't live if it's fake if it's a simulation we respond our brains respond in a different way oh wow man all right you know it's it, way more exciting watching bruce willis uh defend uh you know the um uh the Nakamoto Tower, whatever it is, in uh, Die Hard, than it is watching the DC police defend the uh, Senate chambers. Uh, but one may be more visually exciting, but the other one has that gravitas of reality associated with it. So I wrote a line many, many, many years ago. It came out in one of my novels, came out in Terminal Experiment, 1996. Virtual reality is just air guitar writ large. It will always be fake, no matter how, fidel how, how much high fidelity there is, how much fidelity there is to it. No matter what level of resolution, including, you know, we're talking now and making motion pictures at, um, we already but have how, some, like The Hobbit. How, how will you be able to tell that, though? Well, that's an interesting question, right? That is a very interesting question, because, of course, there are those who would argue we're in a simulation right now, and we've bought into its reality. Um, <laughs> and that's, and that's so funny because that's also the synthesis of, you know, the spirituality with yes. the science. Yes. The question is you can fool the cerebellum. You can fool the most highly developed part of the human brain, but I don't think you can fool the reptilian part. You can, can't fool the amygdala. You can't fool the part of the brain that, somehow recognizes reality versus falsehood. There's a reason why, no matter how exciting Grand Theft Auto or whatever game you're playing is, you still don't get the fight or flight response, the adrenal rush that you would get in a real car crash situation. Um, oh, the part maybe, of our maybe, brain that is not self-awarely conscious is the is the part that mitigates whether or not something is reality for us 
Rob, maybe it has something to do with the, again, it's so fascinating, science and spirituality, whether we call it a simulation or a dream, it's so fascinating, first of all, and the indistinguishable immersion into it, real or fake, uh, whatever those mean. Uh, and then it's so interesting, if there is a sovereign control, if Rob or Atlas have a sovereign control in, in a sense, being able to do something like when you have your, your games and you have all of your, you know, 100 different games on the console and you can at any moment click the, the save button and then switch over to another game, which literally means I would, you know, pause this, save it, and then go into a completely different environment and a completely different, like we were talking about all of the different creation designs and all the different realities that it could potentially exist and immerse myself into that one and begin playing there and then switch between them. So maybe in a sense, part of it has to do with one's ability to, whether you can decipher whether it's uh, real or not, could have something to do with your ability to have sovereignty in clicking the button and switching between different games. Or in this case, if we're immersed in this 80 year game straight, that then this one doesn't have that ability to click the save button and switch to a different game. Something like that. Just something. Yeah, that you may up. very well be right. And you know, there is our consciousness, but there also is our, you know, our microbiome which also is alive. And there's a degree to which you can easily fool me, by and large. I mean, we don't yet have, for instance, we don't simulate it our virtual reality pheromones or even just smells very well. Uh, that if I stop and ask myself, am I really in Toronto, which is where I am? You just go or like am this. I really, you know, in you know, Vatican how, Square? How real you know, is this smell under the armpit? Yeah. Well, right. Am, am I surrounded yeah. by 10,000 other people in Vatican Square right now? No, there's nobody else in this room. I can tell there's nobody else in this room. Whereas I could smell a crowd. You know, if I make the effort, mm -hmm. as Richard Feynman discovered, you know, we talk about humans having almost no sense of smell compared to dogs. And he went around sniffing all kinds of things and said, you know, you actually, you just ignore it. Yeah. Our, 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 reality is we don't pay much attention to smells but if you start you can say oh yeah somebody has been handling this i can smell the sweat the salts that their skin sweat has left on this metallic object um, if i actually attune myself to paying attention to it so i can convince myself visually that i'm surrounded by ten thousand people um, but my microbiome says no rob's all alone we don't have to do whatever um modification or moderation of Rob's behavior that is always going on, you know, with all the, the little bacteria going on saying, you know, Rob should be more anxious or Rob should be more calm or Rob should be this or all of which, which really does happen, right? That there is an interplay between, you know, this entity and, and, and the gut biome and all of that, just as there are, you know, the, um, uh, all, all the bacterial things that can take over, um, ants or amoebas or whatever and cause them to modify their behavior. So whatever simulations we have, we are not yet simulating something where the whole body is buying into the simulation, all of the, the possible entities that make up the individual. And then would that then potentially lead to the, again, very spirituality and science coming together where you have the Ouroboros, the snake eating its, its tail, tail and then the re recursion in science as you could say the procedure calls on itself so reality calls on itself and so in the sense of the transcension hypothesis that idea from john smart the idea that we go inward we go in to these indistinguishable virtual worlds and we continue that that cyclical and that's why even you know, Sir Roger Penrose won the Nobel Prize in physics in 2020, and he has a cyclic cosmology. So even yes. the cutting edge of science is beginning to be like, okay, we, we, some of the spirituality stuff. Yeah. The cyclic eternal exploration. Yeah. Play. 
Yeah, and you know, I mean, I actually know Penrose a little bit. I had a great privilege of speaking with him. Uh, uh, we were all speakers at a conference in Tenerife a few years ago. Um, and, you know, it, it's funny because it comes back to it because, of course, one of the questions that everybody asks every Big Bang theorist is, well, what was there before the Big Bang? And Stephen Hawking kind of wants to say, well, that's an unformable question. You know, you can't answer that because, and Penrose says, no, the easiest answer is it's cyclical, right? So there was always something before and there's always something after. Yeah. And uh, that intuitively is way more satisfying than when a physicist like Hawking uh, will say, you know, your question is irrelevant. Uh, no, it's a really good question. What happened before the Big Bang? Uh, and I, I'm not at all surprised that Penrose and others have come around to this cyclical notion because it makes so much intuitive sense um, compared to the notion that, well, before the Big Bang, there was no time, so you can't ask what before was before. You kind of can ask it. If we can ask it, if we can, we talked earlier about this ability for us to imagine things beyond the Newtonian reality. If we can formulate the question, you're begging it. You're saying, well, that's not a good question, is not a satisfactory, an intellectually or emotionally satisfying answer. If I can ask the question, then your conception of reality is flawed if you can't answer that question other than to say, well, your question makes no sense. It only makes no sense because you haven't got a sufficiently robust paradigm that you're trying to foist upon them. Would you say with a fairly high certainty that the decentralized swarm unilinear evolution that's occurring that orthogenic style evolutionary process is just heading towards both the that expansionary exploration of the cosmos as well as that inward transcension exploration of these indistinguishable virtual worlds that's a really good question um Evolution is not teleological, it doesn't have an end in mind. Um, it's always contingent about what the circumstances are at the moment. And yet, it's produced every epoch more complexity than existed in the epoch before that. With never a step backwards, never in our cosmological history have we looked and said, oh yeah, the universe was, you know, really, it was all monolithic at the Big Bang, and then there was the, you know, photon decoupling, blah, blah, blah. We don't say, you know, and then about 11 billion years ago, it got simple for a while, and then got more complex again. It has always successively become more and more complex. More and more, you can talk about entry, more and more randomness, more and more chaos or disorder. But in terms of biology, there's no stage in the history of life where life went sort of, okay, you know, having, having complex life is going to take a hiatus for a while and we're going to move back towards unicellularism. It never happened that way. So there is some kind of inertia that we try to explain or explain away when we talk about evolution and cosmology. It definitely trend, tends toward, not even tends towards, it absolutely at every step of the way moves towards higher levels of organization, of consciousness, of biological sophistication. You know, we all think it'd be terrifying to be chased by a Tyrannosaurus. The reality is that, guess what? A good mammal can outrun even me, an out of shape 60 year old guy, can outrun a Tyrannosaurus because I've got the benefit of 65 million years of evolutionary honing of what biology can do, of what biochemistry can do beyond what the Tyrannosaurus had. I've got a much more efficient uh, biology, a metabolism than any reptilian, even an archosaurian reptilian like a, like a dinosaur. Has. I can outrun it. I can outrun it, for, uh, sustained running for a longer period of time. And a good human athlete, you know, can 
run circles around it. Uh, uh, you know, today's tiger would take down a Tyrannosaurus easily, right? It moves forward and it gets more complex. And that is something that it's really hard to dismiss um, under our, you know, we want to dismiss it and say, well, that doesn't figure in to our physical conception of reality. But it does seem to be an inalterable part of the universe we live in, that it tends towards higher levels of intellectual organization, higher levels of life forms, higher levels of structural complexity. Yeah. I've also found the the attractor that the complex system evolves towards to be fascinating to hypothesize as that recursive godhead and that another sort of beautiful way of exploring it is like what we were talking about earlier, which is this is the Bayesian cloud. This is that big probability space that leads up to where we're going and all of the different, the possibilities may even exist across all these other designs of, of realities that are happening. I want to ask you a question that is really important creatively. So the way that I've undergone the process of creating and writing and just formulating is I've taken this sort of approach, which is called this sort of diamond approach, which is kind of this idea of like this 10, 10 chapter framework. And so it's like a lattice work in a sense of these 10 chapters and then, or five, or however many somebody wants to go with. But the point is, is that I, I do it in 10, let's say. And then what happens is each one of them has a sort of header. And so for me, like chapter nine was consciousness and chapter 10 was infinity, right? And stuff like that. And so the point is, is that under then consciousness, I would then have a bunch of really good, both writings that I've done, visual illustrations that I've done, right? And then over time, I'm basically just synthesizing and distilling, synthesizing and distilling more and more. And so I'm curious about the process being such a award-winning author is what is the process for you around being able to creatively express your stories? What kind of a framework or process do you follow that enables you to sort of synthesize and distill over time the essence of what you're creating? Well, for me, I'm very much a top-down writer. So I have to have my thematic statement before I can do any of that stuff. You know, they teach you in creative writing class wrongly. Make up a character, write a character sketch, write a bio. You got to have something to say. And that synthesis has to come first. You really have to have whatever it is you're writing about, whether it's, you know, quantum physics, like I wrote about my novel Quantum Night, or artificial intelligence, like I wrote about my novel Wake, for instance. Uh, you have to have really immerse yourself in everything that is said on that topic by all kinds of different people and yep. come up with a synthesis. Now your synthesis may or may not be the same from book to book. I've argued, you know, that AI is both an existential threat and probably our savior in different books. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but for a given book, you have to come up with, this is what I want to say. And once you know what you want to say, it becomes fairly straightforward to devise what characters are going to say it for you. You don't want any of them to be straw men or women. You don't want any of them to just be there to be knocked down. What you find in any sophisticated discussion is that the various point of view holders are sophisticated in and of themselves. The easiest discussion is to pit capitalism against socialism and make one of them a straw man and knock it down. The complex discussion is, you know, there's a lot of value to capitalism. There's an awful lot of value to socialism, too. There's a lot of really bright people who are advocates on either side of both of them. What can we say that 
makes sense and is fresh and new and exciting about economics as an overall topic without saying capitalism good, socialism bad, or vice versa, which is, you know, so much of our discourse today on whatever polarizing topic you want to have ends up being this is the one true answer versus this is this only a stupid person could believe that. You know, Bernie Sanders is not stupid to believe in socialism. Uh, Thomas Piketty is not stupid to believe in capitalism, right? They are uh, very distinct economic models, but they both are really bright guys who are exploring how those two systems can survive in the 21st century. I'm afraid, yeah. speaking of capitalism, I do have a, a, a business call that I have to take in just a couple of minutes. I yeah, we'll, we'll, log, we'll log, wrap this up. I love what you just said there because it's so deep and true with me as well. One of the chapters in the first book I published as well was around the sorting algorithm. And that very much has to do with the, you've mentioned this as well throughout the conversation. You want to, we want to drain the dirty bath water, but we want to keep the babies and we want to bring them together into one. And on the spirituality one, that's like the dogmas and the fundamentalism. And then on the science one, that's some of the perverse incentives, but we want to bring them together, the scientific method, the hierophanies, we want to bring them together into one. And so like you described there with capitalism, socialism, very similar, drain the dirty bath water, bring the two together into one indigenating modernity, USA and China, left and right in USA politics, it works across the board. And so to do that, that's, that's a brilliant style. Yeah, taking the essence at the first, and then sort of breaking it down into what are the subcomponents that I can illustrate. Excellent. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we are so fortunate to live at a time uh, where we have really sophisticated science. We have really sophisticated philosophy. We have really sophisticated theology. We have really sophisticated governance studies. We have really sophisticated sociology. We live at a time where it's almost impossible to be conversant with all those separate fields, and yet a synthesis of them gives us the best opportunity to really understand reality in a way that a century ago before quantum physics or five centuries ago before any kind of modern economic theory or 2000 years ago before much of the terms of the way of modern you know philosophy um we wouldn't have been able to grapple with reality we are fortunate to live at really at the very first time in human history where we have sharp enough tools on every intellectual front to finally start to really answer some of these fundamental questions. It's a wonderful time to be alive. 100%. Love that. Great rap. Totally. Yep. Synthesis is the future in so many ways. And so absolutely. I love that, Rob. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. This has been such an honor and pleasure. My pleasure, Atlas. Live long and prosper, be well, and uh, take care, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Like the video, subscribe if you haven't already. Share it with other people that you think could be positively influenced by it. Again, check out all the links in the bio below, sfwriter.com. Also, Rob's Twitter profile. Go and check those out. Go and support him. Do check out his books. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. We love you very much. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye.